A gentleman from the Toronto region has reached out to me, and the first question he asked was, why do I think that our military and our soft specifically, so our military and our, our soft organizations are fighting an uphill battle? So this is kind of a two-part answer, I believe. So the Canadian Armed Forces right now, yep, they're in a bit of a rut, for sure. There's no question about that. Over the last couple of years, there's been uh, one black eye over another black eye in terms of negative media attention um, based on conduct, based on certain individuals, um, you know, doing or saying certain things. And, you know, it, it does have a negative effect. I, I do believe that the Canadian Armed Forces are in a rut, but I also believe they're going to come out of it. Um, I spent 21 years with the Canadian Armed Forces. 16 of those years were with JTF2. And, you know, in that time, I've seen some peaks and valleys. The reason that I feel um, the military is in an uphill battle right now, first I'll talk about the Canadian Armed Forces. They're there are a lot of good men and women in uniform right now that are are struggling to find their purpose. Why are they doing what they're doing? Um, there's no real short answer, but I do believe they the Canadian Armed Forces need to be better equipped and they need to be better paid. And not that that money is always the main incentive. Uh, when it comes to purpose, folks that are, are choosing a life in the military, they, they want to get behind something. They want to be able to believe in something, whether that's a, an operation, whether that's, um, you know, a function within the Canadian Forces to enhance capability or to develop a, um, a system or a process that's just going to enhance the capability of the military, but also, um, you know, better protect the, the citizens of Canada. They need that purpose. Why do I think that that purpose is not there? You know, not to, not to cast shade on any one particular group, but I'll be completely frank and completely honest. There's a lack of political will. The, you know, the Liberal government, for all that they have done since they've been in power, have not, have not expressed or demonstrated a large support to the Canadian Armed Forces in funding and in operation. Where that translates into the soft community is, you know, Special operations soldiers, they they want to get after it. They are highly motivated, intelligent go-getters. They want to be deployed and they want to be putting evil people in their graves. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. That's a reality. So when we lack political will and in terms with some of the military's hierarchy, so certain individuals in the chain of command an unwillingness to push back and to challenge the government, then we have an unfortunate rut that we find ourselves in right now. The Canadian Air Forces are undermanned. And, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but I, I do know based on some people who are, you know, in those positions to track um, data and numbers, we are undermanned across the board. The Canadian Armed Forces, in order to be a strong armed forces, need specific pieces of equipment and need personnel to, to utilize that equipment. So is there a, a problem with the numbers? There is. So from a recruiting and retention perspective, do I believe that money is the answer? Not in all cases, but I do believe there should be or there could be an incentive to a lower um, more canadians into uniform and then what you'll find is higher quality people from canada who choose a life in the military will then be motivated to then want to advance and choose a life in special forces once guys get to the special forces that's essentially the the pinnacle of operational readiness we need political will to employ these guys to do jobs that they are highly trained and capable of doing. There is a little bit of anonymity between the soft uni units. There is a little bit of, um, of friction between the soft units, but it's not, it's not gross. It's not um, what the media has portrayed it to believe. And when it comes to the special operations organization in Canada, there are four different organizations that make up the special operations and they are designed on purpose to be different. Should there be, or could there be a little bit of overlap between the organizations? So, you know, we have the special operations aviation section. So they, they are the lift, you know, rotary wing, fixed ring, they are the lift. That's one organization. Another organization is called CGIRU. So, those guys are, they're really equipped, educated, and the capability to push forward to deal with anything that's chemical, nuclear, biological related. 
the, those are specialties within a specialty. And then we have CSOAR, which is the Canadian Special Operations Regiment, which sometimes gets con, uh, compared to JTF2. Those organizations are, are very different. And there is a lack of information out there, which, you know, will sometimes, you know, maybe either deter or at least create a hesitation for somebody that's already in the Canadian Armed Forces and they're looking to do something different. So, Yes, there should be, and there ought to be a little bit of crossover, but those organizations are designed to be very different and provide different capabilities, and the mandates are different. So, it, it, you know, in, in turn, to kind of wrap this question up, what do I believe the solution is? The solution, in my belief, is we need political will and political um, overwatch, and we also need the political support to employ these organizations in a manner that they can and they should. And that will help not only retain those individuals that are in, already in uniform, but it's, help, it's gonna help motivate them to wanna stay longer and continue to do good things for the country. So we need political will. And then from the higher uh, echelon elements of the leadership within the Canadian Armed Forces, we need men and women who are willing to push back and maybe disagree with some of the political challenges that they're faced with. Of course, on this side of the camera, it's, you know, it's a little bit easier to say, we need to fix this, we need to fix that, without seeing the full picture of what's going on behind closed doors. But I, I can tell from experience and, and I can speak with confidence, we need certain individuals that are at the hierarchy of the Canadian Armed Forces to push back and say, listen, if you want to keep these guys, that we've trained them, you know, we've spent a lot of money, we've invested time and money, resources to train these guys, and we need to employ them. And, you know, my background was with JTF2. It was not with CSOR, it was not with Sea Dragon, it was not with the uh, Special Aviation um, Squadron. So I can only speak to what I know. And what I do know is from the guys working at JTF2, they want to get after it. They are they are motivated. Um, they are very capable. I literally could pick six to 12 guys who I previously worked with, give them a, a bag full of cash and a problem set, send them into a foreign country, and they are going to figure it out and they'll get the job done. And they want to do that. So we need to employ these guys a little bit more often um, with the effects um, being great to the point where they're going to be motivated to continue to come back year after year after year. Um, why we see sometimes some fr frictions between, you know, CSOR and JTF2, here, here's my take on it. There are guys at CSOR who, from a hands and feet perspective, no question, um, they could do the job of a JTF2 assaulter. In terms of hockey, we'll use an example. An NHL hockey player would be, you know, a JTF2 assaulter. An AHL hockey player who is a professional is getting paid to play hockey, for example, is just not quite at that level, would be a CISO operator. The comparison would be Green Berets or Rangers for CISO. Comparison for JTF2 would be um, SEAL Team 6 or Delta. In comparison, it's unfair to compare us to the Americans, for example, simply because we don't have the same resources, we don't have the same manpower. But what we do have is highly motivated individuals who want to do their job extremely well and are not given the opportunity to do that. The reason that there's sometimes there's friction is because between the two jobs, there is a little bit of carryover and there's a little bit of um, 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 job, job similarities. But ultimately, what guys are being selected for for JTF2 is not the same for what they're being selected for in CSOR. Hence, we have two very different organizations. Both are good. Both have uh, something valuable to add. But as we trickle that down to the k forces, we could say the same thing about our reserves. Our reserves have a lot to offer. They are motivated. They are doing it by choice. They don't have to do it. So we need to enable these folks to become better soldiers, give them the equipment, give them the, the ammunition so they can train properly, and, and, and essentially, in a nutshell, provide for them. So the government can do that. They have the funds to do that. Um, it's just not being allocated um, in a way that I believe could be a little bit more optimal for everybody. So, you know, reservists in the, in the uh, Canadian Armed Forces, RAG Force soldiers in, in the Canadian Armed Forces, special operations soldiers, they all have a job to do. They need the equipment, they need the funding. Most importantly, they need the political support to do their jobs and do the jobs well.